Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Jack. Um, it's been a fascinating uh, couple of days to talk, so thanks for the opportunity to come along. Um, so I sold out, and I've been at banks my whole career, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, I've had a wide variety of roles across banks. <coughs> back office finance, sales and trading, reg reporting, and where I am now, which is engineering and architecture. And um, it's coming up to four years now of being an engineering manager and implementing model-driven engineering using functional programming at JP Morgan. Um, <clears throat> so tell you what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell you what you told them. Um, we're going to talk about organizational complexity and regulation, so echoing a little bit of what Howard said. Um, applying the way we think about applying model-driven engineering in finance. And when I say model-driven engineering, I'm really talking about data models only and things around data models, OK? Um, and then some tough love for all of the academics in the room at the end. <laughs> um, so banks are probably one of the most complicated organizational and bureaucratic systems that humans have ever invented. If I asked every single one of you, what is a bank? The answer will be completely unsatisfactory. And that would include most directors at banks as well. If I ask them the same question, they have no idea. Right. Um, Monzo is a small bank. They have eight products and they've resulted in a service mesh that looks like that. OK, so. Each service is simple, but finance is a very, very complicated domain. You have, as a result, siloed expertise. Conway's law applies, you get siloed systems that have to talk to one another. And Monzo have done a little bit of work on that, but you still get a, a mess of functional complexity. Um, it's my favorite picture ever. Um, that's not JP Morgan, that's some, some retail bank. I could probably make a guess at which one. Um, mortgages. So the mortgage is originated by a customer down there, and then it just explodes. Um, so yeah, uh, you could uh, you could talk to a regulator about that, and they would be uh, very unhappy. So um, that's what we're dealing with. Um, so it, you know that's why we're trying to make things a little bit better with a model-driven engineering approach. Um, regulation again, echoing what was just said. Um, Data governance has become a hot topic. Citigroup, um, refined by the UK um, regulators, £44 million in 2019 for their um, data governance practices. Uh, regulators talk to one another. So then the OCC in America so will get in on that, and then they find them $400 million in 2021. Right. If you don't do data governance, it will wipe away the revenue of whole trading desks for the year, right? So it's really, really important. And those are some of the regulations that apply. Um, so review of internal models, so like we just talked about, um, but also things like uh, the Basel Committee um, talks explicitly about data governance practices. And therefore, the response is really focused on data lineage. So we can track where data is originated and then where it goes. Data quality, so can we validate the actual instances of the data? And then around access and entitlements, so who can see the data? Um, a response that you often find to this is uh, yet another data lake. Uh, I hate them with a, I, yeah, don't do it. Um, <laughs> so they're often a response to gaps in data quality, um, regulatory pressure, or frustration that you can't retrieve the data that you need. So it's like, these are all my data sources from all my trading desks, for example, and they're all on different systems because of course they are. Um, so let's just take all the data that they have and put them into some data lake somewhere, um, you know, in some raw format. And then we have to define a series of transformations where we munge that data together and get it into some form that we can kind of kind of make sense of, right? And then you can have your reporting. Um, <coughs> Problem with that is that um, when we write software, we're writing it in a specific context, so you know, like domain-driven design, really. Um, different contexts have a different view of the same domain. So um, a sales and a support notion of what a customer is may be different, right? Um, 
And therefore, when we shoehorn a, a, a concept like customer and the resulting data model into a centralized place, often you result in a sort of you, you lack design traceability, you lose data lineage, and uh, you compromise data quality <coughs> because there's often gaps because not everyone has the same set of fields. And then who owns the uniform model? No one wants to own the uniform model. Like it's, it's like a hot potato, right? Um, and ultimately, you've solved, you tried to solve the problem in, in, in creating a data lake by adding a, a node to this, right? It, it doesn't solve the problem. So <coughs> data mesh is something that we're quite keen on. This is a concept that's come out of ThoughtWorks. Normally I'd be cynical about uh, that kind of thing, but actually um, I think it's got some legs. Um, so rather than pushing data down to a data lake, you give um, teams the ability to sort of serve up data in a governed way. And so you have to give them things like core infrastructure policy and all sorts of things. Um, and the teams aligned with the business domain while delivering the, the data products. They're the best, you know, they're the experts at that particular silo. That kind of makes sense. And then you kind of federate your, your governance and your, your all that stuff. Um, the issues for banks in implementing this is that um, you have a wide variety of languages, databases, middleware, everything you can think of is being used. We still have mainframes lying around. Uh, compatibility between nodes in a data mesh is not addressed by literature. So when I move a model forwards, how does that impact my consumers? There's nothing there. Uh, <coughs> culture eats policy. So this is a bit of a sort of a change in how you operate. So that requires effort and dollars. Um, and sort of there's a little bit of like cross-functional stuff that is baked into data mesh that's not particularly easy to organize. Um, in a siloed organization. Um, so how we think about it is um, you need to define data models and we at JP Morgan we use MOF, the derivative of MOF to define data models. Um, and we are able to, have, we have a series of code generators in different languages. So we can code generate libraries and also the serialization libraries that I mean, we can send instances of models between say Python and Java. Um, the idea is that you give people the tools to define a data product for a microservice where their interface is generated domain models. And therefore, um, you know, the consumer is also consuming that generated code. <coughs> uh, all data that is published via data products in a given domain must be catalogued, right? So you must be able to know that it's there. You need a taxonomy, right? So there would be a huge taxonomy in banks. Like there's probably, you know, thousands of types of account. So you, you'd have a, a head con data concept called account. And you'd then have a massive tree of different type, types of account. And then you'd be able to sort of tag your data models with those concepts. And therefore you can generate um, a hierarchy where you can navigate data models. Um, you also need shared infrastructure for things like enabling uh, entitlements. So maybe a consumer shouldn't be able to see everything that this data product publishes. So therefore I need some way of evaluating the entitlements policy and actually executing that on the producer side. Right. Um, so that's kind of a very high level architecture of the kind of thing that we are building. Um, you need, uh, at the root of it is a model store. So when you define data models in you know, UML or MOF or any kind of uh, meta model like that, uh, you, there are ways of storing them. And we store them in a, in a temporal way where things are atomized down to their lowest form. And therefore our model store is like a time machine of models. Yeah. So you can ask a question of like, what was this model six months ago? Uh, how did the imports to other models change over time? You can diff the model, um, and then you can ask questions like, between this time and this time, what's the compatibility? Have I made breaking changes? Breaking change might be that you added a new 
uh, mandatory field to a class. Yeah. And that's what the compatibility service does. So, um, for example, uh, a producer wants to upgrade their model, uh, add a, a bunch more classes and attributes to their model. Um, so they're going to do that, but then the compatibility service is going to say, well, actually, you've got consumers of this, uh, this data product and uh, you're going to break them when you upgrade. So you need to manage that with your consumers, right? Um, you need things like a control layer that abstracts away things like connecting to transports. So you should have a common interface for transporting data over the wire. So, you know, whether you're doing like bulk transfer to S3 or over Kafka, uh, real time data, that kind of thing, you can have common interfaces for developers to use with the generated code. Um, access layers are things that can control entitlements. So if you have, if you're able to store entitlements in a particular way and, and execute them, you know, that's really for consumers. So when they're connecting to data sources, they need, you, know, they, you need to serve them up the data that they can see and nothing more. Um, so that all happens on the producer side and they need to filter out data before it gets to the consumer. Um, so yeah, that's sort of you know a very high level um, architecture diagram of what we're doing. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that, obviously. Um, but I think that's the kind of thing that, that, that banks and other complicated organizations should be doing. And in particular, the, the fact that you, you're registering your producers and consumers of models, so therefore you're getting the data lineage. Right. Um, the data catalog should be able to tell you all of the usages of a given model, where the data is originated, where it ends up. And if you get to the stage where you can define mappings and transformations, you can have multi-hop lineage end-to-end, -end, which is the Nirvana. And that's, you just give that to regulators and just go, look how good we are, right? And <laughs> go, go and talk to some other bank. Um, authoring tools, uh, the bane of my life. So um, many are available. You've obviously got case tools, which we've talked about. Um, you have things you can define DSLs in, so like JetBrains NPS. You have the academics favorites of Eclipse modeling. You also have um, interface definition languages, which I tend to like actually. So Smithy from AWS GraphQL. Protoforce is decent. Got Legend from Goldman. Uh, which is kind of a data modeling and execution platform for querying. Um, so there's lots of things available. Uh, so of course we, we're building our own. <laughs> um, I mean, we, we actually do use Magic Core. Magic Core. So our, our architects use Magic Core and uh, we have to do really horrible stuff with what they produce uh, to translate it into our meta model. Um, we're, we're building a, an authoring tool it's text-based, but also projectional. The idea that with an authoring tool is you have that, that smithy. Uh, you have model text, you have a parser, for that you get an abstract syntax tree of your language, and then you have to map it to your meta model. And you can actually generate the abstract syntax tree from your meta model. So you, you model it, co-generate it, define a mapping. In theory, you could co-generate the transformation. Right? That's like what we want to get to. Um, not there yet. Um, but that's just to say that you could take any text-based language that defines classes and things like that um, and map it to some generalized meta model, right? Um, so that the, the authoring tool is kind of less important. Um, what's important is that you can define a mapping and implement the mapping. Um, what we struggle with is uh, is buy-in. Uh, so a lot of developers, nearly all developers, have no idea what a data model is. The fact that there are things like physical models that represent databases, that are logical models, then, you know, just standard classes that we implement all the time. And there are conceptual models where you categorize stuff. No idea. And it's seen as a tax. So you're, you're, you're um, making them change their daily work. Mm -hmm. They don't like it, right? Mm -hmm. Management, uh, we've got 50 people. In, in the team I'm in, and uh, we're, we're expensive, right? So it's it's an expensive endeavor to, to actually implement models of an engineering. 
because of the lack of standardization in the space that we're in, right? You can't hire expertise. Um, no one knows his stuff. And what's the what's the return on investment? How can we make that case? So um, yeah, lack of standardization. Um, and the, the temptation for managers is always to buy. So, oh yeah, uh, you know, I can have a, like this uh, data catalog from I don't know, Starburst or um, any other uh, data kind of warehouse vendor, and uh, it'll be, they're, they're half baked. They don't give you what you need. You don't get linear end to end because not all the data goes in there. You you, you get a vendor in when you want to build a data lake. So you're just making things worse again, right? Um, this is the tough love bit, I'm afraid. <laughs> Um, IDEs, all of the youngsters coming in want to code in VS Code. Okay. Yes, you can do academic work on Eclipse, but no one in this, certainly no one in the bank is going to use it. I'm mm -hmm. afraid, right? It's just how it is. Um, yes, you can use the right. So you could do Eclipse if you're going to produce jars which are independent of Eclipse that like I can use in other tools. Mm -hmm. So the Monaco editor, for example, if you're doing projectional stuff on Monaco, uh, that could be used anywhere. It's kind of standard, right? Um, so think about the tooling. Um, the data architectures that I've talked about, so data lakes, data mesh, and then how they're implemented on cloud. Because there are patterns that are emerging from AWS, Azure, and so on. Um, so how would then monitoring and engineering fit in with that? What could Amazon do with Smithy? They could do a lot more than they're, than they're doing, that's for sure. Um, we need, I think we need some standardization. And what we struggle with particularly is like, you can have a meta model for your classes and, and interfaces, but then you need to define a language for capturing transformations, validating models, and then entitlement policies on models. So they're all the main specific languages around a class model. How can how can we store them? How can we version them against the model? These are all hard questions. Uh, please write books. I know I I think a, a couple a couple of people in the room may have written books recently, but they're quite hard to find. Yeah, but you won't you won't talk about meta models, <laughs> right? So I can't give my people people who join don't know anything about meta modeling. And I, I don't have anything to spoil them at, other than very old books or research papers. There's not a nice, gentle introduction to the space, right? Please write the book. We will buy it. Uh, it won't exactly be a money maker, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you will try. <laughs> yeah, you 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 have a few hundred pounds of uh, of purchases for sure. Um, I know standardization and open source. Uh, so yes, uh, RNG write specifications. They don't write implementations. Mm -hmm. So can we have an implementation, please? In Java, Python, we use Scala. But, uh, it, somewhere to start. We, you should not have to write algebraic data types that um, implement. No, no, it should always be done. <coughs> it be up right? um, and that's it. Any questions? <laughs>